Well, hello, guys. I am back for another, at least for now, patron-only little segment continuing to go through All Rise. We're on Chapter 2 with Judge Gray. Again, I'm in my little reading nook here. Not the best lighting. It's a little bit late, and I didn't have all of my lighting upstairs, but I figured I'd get started anyway, but the sound should be better because I did bring up a better microphone. But without further ado, chapter two, let's see. This was entitled, as we said last time, um, Libertarian Thought and the Libertarian Party, a Tour de Horizon. <laughs> So, I did highlight some things to go over, and I would really recommend that you check out Chapter 1. You know, go through this together, and if you have the book, or you want to decide if it's something you would like to add to your library. What's really interesting is, before he gets into the history of the Libertarian Party, he goes way back in history to um, Lao Tzu in 6th century China. And he quotes Lao Tzu, I think I'm pronouncing that correct, as saying, without law or compulsion, men would dwell in harmony, which is a kind of a great anarchist statement. This is interesting that Judge Gray would put that in there, so, since I know um, he's not of that mindset. And then he continues for... for uh, he continues forward to Tertullian, who is an early Christian church father, and quotes Tertullian as saying, It is a fundamental human right, a privilege of nature, that every man should worship according to his own convictions. One man's religion neither harms nor helps another man. It is assuredly no part of religion to compel religion, to which free will and not force should lead us. Interesting. And he notes that he does have a project that stresses the many commonalities amongst world religions at www.projectunderstanding.com. I have not yet checked that out. And he continues through history, um, talking about St. Thomas Aquinas, John Locke, Adam Smith. Then it moves up to the time of the American Revolution, in which he states that the Declaration of Independence is perhaps the most exceptional example of libertarian thought ever committed to paper. I am a fan of the Declaration of Independence, but call me biased, I think the Statement of Principles is probably the most exceptional example of libertarian thought ever committed to uh, paper. And if you have been paying attention to my Libertarian Party time capsule episodes, the early uh, founders of the party certainly compared it to the Declaration of Independence. And he goes on to quote a Benjamin Franklin quote that I dearly love, even though some people say it was really taken out of context. It's true no matter what where Franklin warned that anyone who would trade a little less liberty for a little more security deserves neither. And he continues with Thomas Paine's, give me liberty or give me death. How far we have come from those lessons, correct? And some other, a lot of this is a lot of quotes, a lot of it's early American history, which I, I think you know, and as far as the writing of the Constitution and such. But I like this uh, Rousseau quote that I prefer liberty with danger to peace with slavery. I wish we believed that today. It seems that we would prefer to be locked in our homes and give up all of our liberty for a virus which has a over 99% survival rate. And then he observes that, I'm probably going to butcher this name, Alexis de Tocqueville, who had uh, come from France. And he wrote a book about his experiences in early America entitled Democracy in America. And Judge Gray states that in this book, 
He praised the experiment of democracy, but cautioned that it would probably work until American politicians discovered that they could buy the citizens' votes with their own tax money. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? And he also points out that at this point in history, Bastiat was finishing his work called, I believe that he doesn't give the title, but I would believe that would be the law. And Bastiat was a member of French parliament. And he said that Bastiat observed the slippery slope of socialism and witnessed what he described as legal plunder. And Judge Gray explained that this meant the manipulation of the law, institutions, and systems by which one group to redistribute wealth, property, and power to another. And notes that Bastia asserted the state is the great fictitious entity by which everyone seeks to live at the expense of everyone else. And it's funny, it's all these great anarchist quotes, yet, but that's not the conclusion that Judge Gray reaches. And he shares an insight from his friend Jim Turney, who I know well, um, a very great libertarian and um, explains how Bastiat really captured Jim's imagination. Well, Judge Gray noted, I, I believe this is Jim's observation, but it, it's kind of unclear, but it says he pointed to the shared humanity we have and that if the natural tendencies of mankind are so bad that it is not safe to permit people to be free, how is it that the tendencies of these governmental organizations are always so good? Do not the legislators and their appointed agents also belong to the same human race? Or do they believe that they themselves are made of a finer clay than the rest of mankind? It's that uh, meme we often see, the circle, right? Government, I mean, people are bad, so we need government made of people who are bad, so we need government made of, you know, that whole thing, which is an anarchist meme, by the way. But he has a very interesting observation here on campaign finance. And he believes that the current laws that we have have strongly um, contributed to the polarization that we have because it leads to that type of fundraising. So I'd like to actually quote an entire paragraph from Judge Gray because I found this very interesting. He says, what should be done? If Bill Gates could spend as much money as he would want on his own election campaign, he should also be able to spend all he wants for other candidates or issues of his choice as well. It's all a matter of free speech and liberty. However, all contributions above a certain fairly small threshold amount should be immediately disclosed, both to the government election commissions and publicly on the Internet. Then, for example, if voters believe that a recipient candidate is in Bill Gates' pocket, they can always vote for that candidate's opponent. However, no non-human entity should be allowed to contribute to any candidates or initiatives whatsoever. Why is that? It's also a matter of liberty. If corporations contribute money, they should first get the unanimous consent of their shareholders because they are spending their shareholders' money. And often, the shareholders do not support that particular candidate or cause. Of course, corporations would always be free to appeal to their shareholders to contribute their own personal money if they wanted. But that would be all they should be able to do. The same thing goes for labor unions or any other entities. This approach, engaging liberty, reduce, would reduce the chicanery, unfairness, polarization and frustration that are heavily present in our elections at this time and it would also increase freedom of choice so once again liberty works i agree mostly and i agree this would be a great interim step that of course if somebody can spend as much money as they like on their own campaign they should be able to spend their money as they like any other way it does seem to support however government election commissions and that I cannot support. If people are concerned about money and politics, there would be voluntary disclosure organizations that people could refer to and candidates who referred, who refused to disclose, you could then look at with a stink eye. Now, the situation with corporations is a little bit complicated. Um, unlike most libertarians, well, I don't even going to say most, but I know many 
and including many in the Libertarian Party, I do not believe corporations are libertarian. And I believe that is the way to the lib- liberta- libertarian, quote unquote, dystopia that many, I think, rightly fear that we would be trading government for corporations. And why should they obtain the unanimous consent to spend shareholders' money when they don't have to do that for any other decision that they're spending money? I think a better argument can be made that corporations are not people and they should not be able to contribute. But as an interim step, this isn't bad. I just uh, agree with the reasoning um, somewhat. And then he travels forward to the actual establishment of the Libertarian Party um, in December 1971 in Colorado. And noted that the urgency to create the party peaked after Nixon's speech in 71 regarding implementation of wage and price controls. And uh, Judge Gray explained that this really mattered because a wage and price controls make it far easier for the government to condone inflation. He notes that two years prior, David Nolan had developed what came to be known as the Nolan Chart. And I really like that Judge Gray did note the writing of the Statement of Principles and simply quoted the first line, which a lot of people are embarrassed by and I just happen to adore. So I was really pleased that he quoted it, which is, we, the members of the Libertarian Party, challenge the cult of the omnipotent state and defend the rights of the individual. Pure poetry. And he goes on to relate the 1972 election campaign of John Hospers and Tony Nathan and said that they had a campaign budget of less than $7,000. That is interesting. What a low amount. But they did a lot with it. They got an electoral college vote. And uh, that electoral college vote was from a faithless elector in Virginia named Roger McBride. My old brain forgot the first name for a moment. And then he um, relates that McBride went on to run for president himself on the Libertarian Party ticket in 1976. And he notes that McBride spent 500000 on his own campaign. And it was, I believe, his own money, it seems to say. Yep, it was 500000 of McBride's own money. And he noted that paled in comparison to Bloomberg's short-lived $500 million self-funded 2020 campaign. But he said McBride's investment raised eyebrows back in the day. And he had converted his own DC-3 plane, which he piloted through 48 states. That is very cool. And said that the party also used television advertisement, fully leveraging the FCC rules for equal airtime. I had never heard that before, and that would surprise me. I don't doubt Judge Gray. But leveraging FCC rules seems not like something the Earlywood Party would do. Not that I necessarily object, it's just that surprises me. And they were on 32 state ballots at that time. He notes that 1980 is, or around then, was when David and Charles Koch began funding libertarian causes and gave birth to the Cato Institute. Notes that 1980, which I I did not know this, 1980 was the year that the Statue of Liberty was adopted as the official party symbol, much better than the chicken on a stick. And says this was a tumultuous time for the party as there was a lot of infighting, which is something I had heard before, but that by 1985, there were 49 libertarians in elective office around the country. Then in 1987, Dr. Paul, Dr. Ron Paul, left the Republican Party. And this is super cool. In Big Water, Utah, libertarians won every city council seat. And that was in 1987. And then in 1998, the African-American civil rights leader, Roy Innes, joined the LP. 
and I did recall seeing that in the historical records. With Judge Gray joining the LP in 2001 following the passage of the Patriot Act. And he ends the chapter with the highest vote totals that the Libertarian Party had received with Governors Gary Johnson and Bill Weld, Boo Hiss, Bill Weld, um, who received 4.5 million votes, which was 3.27% of the total vote nationwide. Though I think comparing just number of votes isn't exactly the most productive way to judge the relative success of the various campaigns because it doesn't adjust for population, though I'm not diminishing their accomplishment at all. All right, that is it for Chapter 2. We will do Chapter 3 next, uh, which is entitled Liberty and Justice. So I will see you next time with that. I will tell you, I think this is a really good book to give to your libertarian curious friends. It is very non-threatening and easy to understand, but I'm sure I'll repeat that a bunch of times. So I will see you next time. Bye-bye. Mi de libertad.